today we'll just kind of briefly talk a little bit about histologies. And I'll throw a slide up there, and you will have to try to name all these that, I, that you've heard today. And you'll see pretty quickly. And then we'll just briefly talk about the principles of oncology, okay? Because there are eras, as you heard, that we go through. So here is the slide. Today you probably heard about most, I, I think I've heard almost every single one of these, or at least components of it. In oncology, specifically sarcomas, we love to name things by their short names. LMS, SS, OGS, EWS, uh, D-differentiated chondrosarcoma, mixed-oid liposarcoma, we have names for all of these. Uh, but in reality, there's 50 different types, and there's probably more than that. Yeah, so MFH, they changed to UPS. Yeah. Hemangiopericytoma is not a noun anymore, it's an adjective. You know, they, it's a description of another tumor, uh, hemangiopericytomatis. So they, those are changing all the time. Yeah, it's crazy. And the more we know, the less we know, and the more categories we get. So the nice thing about, people always ask, well, why do you want to be a sarcoma oncologist? Because we're learning every single day. It's not the same every single day, and it changes. So the quiz, United States, there's only 18,000 cases can be diagnosed with sarcoma this year. That's kids and adults. It accounts for less than 1% of all cancers. So you're in a group of physicians here that this is a very th a rare thing. A busy cancer practice might see one or two new cases a year. You know, if you think about two or three hundred cases at one percent, you get the idea. Now at the clinic, at you and re you know everywhere, it, it's funneled. Everything gets funneled into our group, and we're very fortunate and blessed for that. In the adults, you know, I put seventy percent, thirty percent. It could be eighty, twenty. The vast majority of soft tissue. So if on a board question, what's the most common sarcoma? It's not going to be Ewing's. It's not going to be OGS for adults. It's going to be one of the 50 soft tissue that you have to kind of remember. So the main principles of chemotherapy are what? We want to kill the tumor. So when we started all this, we wanted to kill tumors without killing the patient. And we thought that we're going to devise a drug to kill it, and then we won't need that we'll be out of business. Okay? And that's when Randy and I probably started in the 70s and 80s, so we thought so. The problem is, the chemo that we gave killed things that are rapidly dividing. It was not very specific to cancers. In fact, if you look at a cancer cell, the PhD people, the machinery is about 99% normal. It's less than 1% abnormal, but we're trying to leverage that 1%, but 99% of the cells are normal. Uh, of the cell components are normal, so you're going to get collateral damage all the time. Principles of chemotherapy are no different than they were before. So I stopped using the word chemotherapy. What do I use now? Systemic therapy. Because half the stuff we use now are trying to give drugs by mouth, drugs by shots, hormone by shots, hormone by pills, or something that globally takes care of everything. Radiation only works where you turn the beam on. Surgeons only operate what they can see and remove. Systemic therapy is kind of what we need and get better at, and we've kind of had some problems. Now, we still use today for sarcoma <coughs> cytotoxic drugs, drugs that try to kill things. The vast majority. Um, the problem is, is, as we said, it doesn't always work on all cells, and the cells become resistant to it. We know that certain cancers are not a problem of growth, but a problem of dying. And if you'd spend a lot of time in the lymphoma world or the CLL world, CLL is not a cancer of growth. It's really a cancer of forgetting to die. They just get bigger and they never die. They just live forever and they just clog up things. So trying to kill things that are rapidly dividing, well, that ain't going to work for CLL. And some of these tumors are not going to work. So there's some limitations. So then the big thing is, oh, let's get targeted therapy, right? Let's try to find something that only kills or targets the cancer cells. Well, those are the kind of what Dr. Hurley said is, well, we have all these nice little targets that we want to hit. Tyrosine kinase inhibitors, imatinib, glevic, serafinib, uh, lanotinib. There, there are hundreds of them, not hundreds, but there are lots of them. 
We have mTAR inhibitors. These are pathways that we leverage that are targeted therapy. We have hormonal therapies that target hormones. We have monoclonal antibodies that target certain receptors. Everything I've talked about targets cancer cells, but also normal cells too. Because remember, these targets are on all of our cells as well. Some a lot, some are not, so we get preferential kill. But targeted therapy is not always, it, it targets it, but we want really something that's uber targeted. And we don't always have that. So the biggest next wave is what, immunotherapy. How many watch TV and see Keturah art, uh, ads? Who sees Aptivo ads? Okay, Nivalumab or Pembolizumab, these are all commercially, you drive by, you see on the buses these things, you go to the airport, you see all these uh, ads. Immunotherapy. Now how does this immunotherapy really work? Does it kill the cell? No. <laughs> what does it do? It either ramps up the immune system or it allows, it kind of takes the brakes off the immune system. 100%. So really, you're trying to allow your own immune system to fight the cancer. Somehow the cancer produces hormones or a substance, technical terms, that allows the immune system to bypass it and think it's normal. These immunotherapy agents that we give by vein kind of bind those proteins up and allow the immune system to rev up and kill itself. We're not really attacking the cancer cells, but we're really allowing your own immune system to fight it off. That sounds like the best thing to do. Well, we always say, we think we're smart, but cancer's smarter. But we have to be smart, and that's why we're all here today. But this is kind of a neat thing. The problem is when you unleash your immune system, sometimes it wreaks havoc on the normal cells as well. You know, we know somewhere between 10 and 20% are going to get attacking the pituitary gland. Well, what happens when you attack the pituitary gland and it doesn't work? You become hypopit. Well, you need those hormones, and then you get, you know, sodium, potassium, adesonium problems, you get thyroid problems, you get skin problems, you get lung problems, you get, you can imagine anything that can get attacked starts getting attacked. So we have to be a little bit careful. Why do we know this is important? Because it works in a lot of tumors. Does it work in sarcomas? Maybe out of the 50, there might be two. UPS and D-differentiated liposarcoma are the two that are leaning the edge on that. So we'll see how that pans out. So whenever we see somebody, and we're gonna give them systemic therapy, we only need to know what are our goals of therapy. And if we can define that with the patient and their family, they're going to be infinitely happy of what you are here for. Because you're setting the tone, you're setting the expectations, and you generally are not going to let them down. So can we cure people with chemotherapy alone for sarcomas? The answer is no. Maybe we can cure people with testicular cancer, don't you think? Probably. But maybe with leukemias we can cure. Maybe lymphomas we can cure. Probably not sarcomas with chemo alone. So the goal alone is not that. Now on the other hand, you heard a lot about us giving chemotherapy before surgery and after surgery to improve the odds that you're going to cure somebody. That's called adjuvant. And we do a lot of that. And we'll go over some data on that. Unfortunately, if the cancer recurs and we don't have therapy to get rid of it, but we have therapy to control it improve the odds that they're going to live longer but not get rid of it, that's all palliative. Having that discussion with the patient, is it curative by chemo alone? Or are we giving chemo to prevent it or reduce the chance of it coming back? Or we're never going to get rid of it, we're giving chemo to try to prolong your quality of life, are the important three factors. And that's what Dr. Hurley said, that's what we spend the vast majority of our time discussing. Is it worth palliation? Is it worth the side effects of treatment? And those are the, those are the <coughs> crucial conversations that we have every day with every single patient in their family. So, I feel like a surgeon now. I took a photograph. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a young gal, 40 years old, and I've shared this before. She presented with a lump in her arm. It was rapidly growing. She's not on blood thinners. She didn't bump it. 
And it came on pretty suddenly. You can see it there. So you do the exam. It's firm. She has good function. What's the next imaging that you would like to get done? We think it's a soft tissue tumor, so is the next step to get a PET scan or an ultrasound or is the right exam to get an MRI? It's more than three centimeters, okay, it's probably close to six to eight centimeters just on physics, it's, it's big. So to discern, you probably need to get an MRI, because the MRI is really good at distinguishing soft tissue lesions. So here's an MRI. So the first thing you notice on the left is T1. It's not a fatty tumor. Because fat should be white, but it's not white. So it's like muscle. <coughs> on T2, it's bright. So it's pretty, you know, at this point, we technically call it indeterminate, but worrisome. It's deep. Okay? So it's not a hematoma. It's not a cyst. And it's not a lipoma. That's what you can tell from this. We do have an enhancement too later on. I'm not sure if I have an enhancement. So, the next thing we want to do is do a biopsy. Dr. Ogilvy talked about that they do a lot of open biopsies. At Mayo, we do a lot of CT guided biopsies or ultrasound. There's no right or wrong, just what we do. Um, we had the diagnosis, and it was a primitive round cell sarcoma, a high grade blue round cell tumor. And as you heard earlier on, we do a lot of molecular testing on it, and we couldn't figure out exactly what it was, because we tested for EWSR, as well as NR4A3 gene rearrangements, looking to see if it's a C-duck, or a B-core, or a synovial, excuse me, or Ewing sarcoma. Now, it doesn't mean anything to us today, but we have to realize is that this is a very aggressive tumor, it acts and behaves more like a Ewing sarcoma because it's a small round cell, but right now it doesn't have any of the markers. Very rare, very primitive. So we historically treat this as a Ewing sarcoma, and we had to make sure that it didn't spread anywhere, so we did a PET scan. And the nice thing about the PET scan, you start to realize, where's the sugar activity? Is it in the middle or in, yeah, it's at the edge? So when you're putting the needle in it, just like the MRI, you don't want to put the needle in here, you want to put the needle in where the red stuff is. So often, you can imagine the ones we see, if you do it in the office, you're going to miss the red stuff potentially, unless you know exactly what you're doing. So we kind of have image guided to kind of make sure, because if you hit the dead stuff, it's not going to happen. Right, the challenge is you can't get a PET scan unless you have a diagnosis of a tumor, and you can't get a diagnosis of a tumor unless you have histology, so that's a challenge that we it's have a circular been working with. Exactly. Yes. And for some reason, the U, they're, they're very harder to get these PET scans approved, I know. It's, yeah. it's different. Yeah. So, data. You know, we love data in uh, oncology, and the, these are the studies for Ewing sarcoma, and it's important to know. 2003 is when this study was done, and this was comparing three drugs versus five drugs, and it's all you really need to know. And the reality is that with non-metastatic disease, five drugs did better than three drugs. So the standard treatment now is giving three, uh, five drugs versus three drugs. Okay? And you can see here, here's the event-free survival, and you see about 70% with five drugs. We thought that was pretty good, so then we did Another study, this is 2012 now, and the study was no longer taking five drugs versus three drugs, because we already proved that five drugs is better than three drugs. Let's get those same five drugs every two weeks or every three weeks. That's the only difference. This is called dose dense every two weeks. This is the standard, taking five drugs repeated every three weeks. Same drugs, but giving them in a shorter interval. Um, lo and behold, it turned out that five drugs repeated every two weeks is better than every three weeks. So if you're getting chemotherapy for Ewing's, even in an adult, we tend to try to start out with an every two-week regimen, just to let you know, standard of care. 
Chemotherapy is important because without chemotherapy, 80-90% are going to have metastasis despite surgery. But with chemotherapy, you saw the survival still not 100%, but a lot better. It's getting close to 70 to 80% cure rate. So here, another gal comes in with knee pain. This one is a little bit more, well, there's a cognitive triangle, do you think there, Chris? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there is. This is a little bit more obvious, though, because you can see it pointing out that way, but there's a big chunk out of there as well. We talked about things at the growth plate. Now, now her, she's a mature bone, but this is a, a 30-year-old. So the first thing you're going to think about is this a primary bone tumor or metastatic disease. This age group, probably primary bone, looking at it. So the thing we do is kind of make sure there's no other spread anywhere else. And the bone scan lights up around the knee there area. That's the bladder, you don't need to worry about it, but there's nothing else. We then do, like everybody else does, an MRI to see the soft tissue extension, because this is needed for planning for surgery, because you've got to think about what is my plan for surgery. Um, you can see in the coronal cut, the soft tissue component there. Uh, with enhancement, this is a, basically a sagittal cut. It's, or this might be even that same. There's a lot of soft tissue extension. And then you also have uh, the actual cut there. So this is a fairly big tumor. So you don't want to go in and start <coughs> doing an operation right off the get-go. You probably want to get a biopsy and then probably start some chemotherapy. So what is that? This turned out to be an osteogenic sarcoma. And that's simple. And if you leave here today, this is still today the most talked about study today. It's called the Urema study. It's a European-American uh, study where they took everybody who gets chemotherapy, the standard chemotherapy is here, two cycles of a very aggressive chemotherapy, doxorubicin or adromycin is A, cisplatinum is P, and high-dose methotrexate is the M, we do two of those. Then here is where surgery is done, after two cycles of chemo. And then if you have a good response, now what's a good response? After chemo and the surgeon takes it out, the pathologist looks at it, cuts it all up, and estimates how much is dead. And if more than 90% is dead, it's called good. If it's less than 90%, it's called poor. It's kind of a bad way to say it, but it is poor, okay? We thought at that time if you've had a good response, can we make it better by adding interferon? Randy, Dr. Hurley talked about it. And lo and behold, there is a lot of activity around interferon and standard chemo. We want to make a good person better by adding interferon versus staying the same. If you have a bad response, let the computer decide, stay the same or add intensive chemotherapy using different drugs called iphosphamide etoposide. If you are a parent and had a patient, your son or daughter, who went through two cycles of chemotherapy, underwent surgery, and 100% was still living, would you allow the computer to decide to continue with the same chemo? No. Okay, so this is why this study was a hard sell. Technically, as a medical oncologist, we do not know if staying the same chemo made a difference versus switching to a different chemo. So ethically, we let the computer decide, even if you get a poor response, see what happens. Now, Chris, maybe you want to describe why this was here. Why didn't we do surgery first? Because in the old days, oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so when the chemotherapy was invented, if you will, in the 70s, you realized, oh, we have these cytotoxic agents, and they might be good for this cancer thing. Um, so what the way we were doing is, like say, we are doing amputations right off the bat, because we want to get the cancer out of there, and that still wasn't too satisfying. So well, I'll tell you what, we have this chemo thing, and we said, well, you know what? 
I got a new thing too. We're actually making bones out of titanium, but it takes a long time. You know, we have to go to the, the foundry and, and get it right and, and make a decision about how long it should be and we custom make every one. That's gonna take us about three months, maybe you know, two to three months. Why don't you give this new chemo stuff while I go make the bone? We'll see if that works. And that just became the habit. And there's still some controversy as to whether that even gives you the best. Maybe I should do the surgery up front and that would give us the best prognosis. Um, but that's, that's been the habit. That's been the commonplace way to do things. So studies were done later on in Europe where half the people went to surgery right off the get-go, half the people went and had chemo first, and the survival was the same. So just to let you know, it's historical reasons why the factory needed to make these prostheses before... And that's no longer true, but no, we still do can, it that way. Exactly. So just let people know. And today, tomorrow, he can ask for the prosthesis. He can yeah, go to the shop tonight it's, and go get it. It's like a Lego set. You just yeah, have them all. <laughs> it's, kind of sad. it's kind of neat. So here, what, what did the results show? Remember I told you, this is the good group. More than 90% response. Half went on the same chemo, half got interferon. This is the event-free survival. This is the interferon group versus the standard chemo. And this is the overall survival. Statistically, it's the same. So if you have chemo and you take it out, it's more than 90% dead. Standard approach is to continue on with the same chemo. What's the cure rate? Three years out, roughly 92%. Pretty good, isn't it? So that's, that's the exciting part. Um, what about the poor responders? You know, poor responders are the ones that go through chemo, have no response, or less than 90% cell kill. Uh, here is the study looking at changing chemo to more aggressive chemo versus staying the same chemotherapy and that's the event-free survival. Here's the overall survival. So today, changing chemotherapy despite not having a good response doesn't improve survival, so we stay the same. Now, it's sobering. It's very, very hard for me to tell a patient and their family, we gave you chemo, 10% is dead, let's stay with the same chemo, but here's the data. Survival's the same compared to changing chemo. So what we have to say is you have to do this study, you have to abide by it, but I can tell you a lot of us may not believe what this, well, change the therapy, because it doesn't show that it's worse, it doesn't show that it's better, but there are a lot of leukemias that develop because of the iphosphamide and etoposide, so you have to remember that. Now, what I take, what we take away from this is, what's the cure rate, even with poor responders? 70%, close to 70%. So when you say poor, it kind of, you can see the, the faces of the patients and their families, they had a poor response, but still, 70% cure rate, it's a little bit different than the 90% rate for cure, but it's not like we're done. There's still things that we can do. So that's how we look at it. Question. Yeah. How do they know that there isn't just some better chemo out there that they didn't discover yet? I mean, how do you know that the chemo that didn't work or gave them a poor response, that this other stuff you used is better? You know, clearly it's not that much, it's not different in the outcome, but I'm saying how they choose that versus other, what about other treatments they haven't even thought of? 100%. So you're asking, how did this wannabe become available? Yeah, and why that one? And right. Back in the day, when men and women had tumors that grew after chemotherapy, they used this chemotherapy and they had about a 20-30% response rate. Okay, when the treatment was no longer for cure, it was for palliation. Mm -hmm. So these are active and try to kill things. So iphosphamide is active, etoposide is active. Back in the day when this was designed, I told you this was 2008 or early, it's taking mm -hmm. you know, 10 years to do the study, not just in the United States, but in Europe and combining all this data. 
So they have to pick, as you said, the most promising combination to use. That and the day with the most promising. Okay? Now, the children's oncology group has done seven more trials to try to figure out what's the next best drug to try. One or two might be potential. All the other ones have not been very successful. So today, the issue is should we do different chemotherapy? Should we try different things? Yeah. Well, those are all trials. And then eventually, we're going to go back to the drawing board that maybe it's not cytotoxic chemo. <laughs> is it a different target? Or is it immunotherapy? Or should we go back to the drawing board and learn a little bit more biology? You know, Dr. Ogilvy's colleague spends time, doesn't, doesn't that's what his lab is, doesn't he? Uh, Dennis did, Dennis, yeah. but, but the more exciting things at the U is we have some of our veterinary people who see a lot more sarcomas in dogs than we do, and they have opportunity for a lot more reps, and so some of the medicines that they have found to be effective, we're going to try to bring into trial. So, so we have some other, other avenues of finding out things that work uh, reasonably well in a very similar uh, large animal model. Well, I guess those are not large animals, they're kind of the, the medium animals, but, uh, but a very similar animal model. And so that's, that's an exciting thing that they're trying to get going right now, is to get someone to, uh, to, to help them with this trial. So there's a lot of things so, to be developed. Yeah, if you have ideas. We'd love to have them. Yeah, I'm sure you want my ideas. Because we're, we're trying to say, like, you know, what, which is the way to do it? Now, I, I would be even more remiss if I didn't tell this part. We don't care about the 66%. We care about the 32%. Because they went through chemotherapy. It worked in about 70% of the people for the last four years. So. You can hear by my comments, you in sarcoma, we tweet. We didn't change the drugs. We used the same drugs changed from three weeks versus two weeks. That took 10 years. <clears throat> okay, so we're tweaking. Anything else?